Hi there, I'm Megan McCollum, and this is Tips for Success for All Students in PE. I wanted to give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I went to St. Cloud State, where I received my bachelor's degrees in health, physical education, and adapted physical education. I then went to Mankato State University for my master's in educational technology. I worked at Robbinsdale Area Schools for four years teaching adapted physical education. I then went to California and worked at De Anza College uh, as a technology training specialist. And I've now returned to Minnesota and I work again in Robbinsdale Area Schools teaching special education and adapted physical education. I am currently the MinShape webmaster and the central district director. So what is adapted PE? Adapted physical education follows the same curriculum as the general physical education class. Students with disabilities should have adaptations and modifications to the games, activities, and equipment in physical education classes. Students should be taught in the least restrictive environment. So what does this mean? This means that students with disabilities should be getting the same curriculum, the same content as their general ed peers, but you're just making changes to the activity, uh, the games, the equipment, and the area that they are playing in. Uh, students should be taught in the least restrictive environment. So this means that whatever is least restrictive for the student so that they can be the most successful is where they should be. So if it's a small group setting, if maybe it's a push-in model, so you're working with a special ed student in a general ed setting, um, maybe you're working just with a small group of special ed students that are all in one class. Um, those are all different options that you can do. So some modifications and adaptations that you can make to your classroom to help your students be more successful. Uh, there's three main areas that you want to focus on. The first being equipment. So you want to make sure that you're using equipment that is big and bright. That way it's a lot more easy for people to see. Um, if there's students with visual impairments in your classes, if you've got bigger equipment and brightly colored equipment or equipment that contrasts the background, like if your walls are all white, you're going to want to use um, equipment that is contrasting that. So you're not going to want to use a giant white volleyball in a gym that's all white. Um, you're also going to want to make sure that you use lightweight objects, lightweight equipment, so that your students who maybe aren't as strong with their muscular strength, um, they will be more successful as well. So they can still use that same equipment as long as it's lightweight and it's easier for them to move around. Uh, a lot of times if you're using lightweight equipment, it's also slow moving, which again is going to help with processing time. It's going to help the students to be able to see where the object is in space and where it's moving to and give them that extra processing time that they need to be able to get to that equipment. Use things that have different textures. So a lot of times with my students, I have just a big bag of various sizes and colors and shapes and textures of balls that I've found at dollar stores or uh, pharmacies or Target. Um, you can find a lot of very inexpensive equipment. Um, sometimes maybe even it's dog toys or cat toys, but it's got, you know, different textures to it that help you um, to help your students to be able to grip them. Um, so if they've got more texture, there's more surface area for the students to be able to grip the equipment and then um, they'll be more successful rather than letting a ball slip through their hands. They are able to just grasp on, maybe it's got holes in it. Maybe you've got a big ball that's um, got holes all the way around it. Similar to like, I guess, imagine a soccer ball without the um, spots filled in. So it's just the outlines of the soccer ball. Um, if you can find equipment like that, or if you can make equipment like that, that's also super helpful because then students can maybe grab just with a finger. They are able to get into the, one of those little loops in the ball and catch. Um, equipment with sound. So for students who have uh, visual impairments, if they can hear the equipment coming to them, then it's easier for them to be able to know where that is as well. So um, I've got a student who is completely blind. So I use a lot of things that are not necessarily equipment that you would find in your 
PE classroom, but I've bought bells um, online. I found some wristbands that I can then attach to different um, like nets and hoops and different things so that they make noise when my student is um, throwing or hitting or striking a ball and it hits that bell or that net or the hoop, the bell makes a sound so my student knows that he was successful. Um, you can also buy balls that have beepers inside of them or balls that have bells inside of them. So anything that you can find that makes noise um, can be really helpful for students with visual impairments. All of these things also are really helpful for just anyone in general. I mean, a, a typical peer, if they are in class and, you know, maybe they're not super great at football, but if they can um, s use a larger ball that's slower moving and give themselves a little bit more processing time, they might be more successful as well. So these aren't things that you have to use only for students with disabilities. Everyone can benefit from any of these modifications to the equipment. The next area that you're going to want to modify um, and make adaptations to is the rules. So maybe you're playing a game of Ultimate Frisbee and every player has to touch the Frisbee on the team before they can score a point. Um, a lot of times you are going to want to make it so that it's successful for everyone. So everyone, even if they're maybe not as athletic as their typical peers in the class, um, they still can have that success and they can still feel like they accomplished uh, something with their team. And again, it helps with the sportsmanship. I mean, they're building that relationship with their peers and they're making sure, you know, when they're throwing to someone, they're making eye contact. And so it's engaging a lot of really great things for the students in the class. You can always change the number of players on the team. So instead of having um, six on six for volleyball, maybe you have eight players or um, maybe you have fewer players because you've made things smaller, the, um, the boundaries of the game might be smaller, and so you maybe need fewer players. Uh, but whatever it is that you can tell that your students would be more successful with, maybe you have them play with partners. So they're playing a game and they are a team with another person, and that's going to help. You can balance out your students' ability levels and make the partners so you are able to make the teams a little bit more fairly. Uh, put everyone on a scooter. So a lot of games that you play, again, Ultimate Frisbee, I'll use a, as an example, you can play on a scooter. So if you just put everyone on a scooter, that levels the playing field. So everyone then is going to be struggling and they're going to have to do more steps and they're moving around on scooters while still trying to play the game. Um, for instance, volleyball, you could play sit volleyball. So you just lower the net, um, maybe use a badminton net instead of a volleyball net, or lower it to the ground and every, have everyone sitting on the ground. Um, so your students in wheelchairs, you could get them out of their wheelchair if they're able to support themselves um, while sitting on the ground, and then they could play sit volleyball. So you're still doing a lot of the same uh, rules and point system and things like that, but just making some minor changes to make your students more successful. Um, again, like I said, play adapted sports. Everyone can benefit from that. Beat baseball, goal ball, uh, sit volleyball. Those are all games and activities that anyone can play. They were just made specifically for people with disabilities. Um, so if you haven't heard about any of those, goal ball is awesome. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you've got three on three. There's a really big net. You could even, if you don't have a, that size net, you could even just make markers um, or use cones as the goals and you use a ball with a bell inside of it and then you roll it across to the other side and try to score and every player has to wear a blindfold or a mask so that they can't see um, so look that game up that's a lot of fun that uh, doesn't take a lot of equipment that you wouldn't necessarily already have in your gyms uh, another area that you would want to modify and adapt is your playing area. So make small sided games. So rather than having six on six volleyball, maybe you only have two on two volleyball and you use a half court or three on three volleyball. Um, make the games just a smaller version. So that way it's still, like I said, the same rules, the same game, you're following the same directions, but it's just smaller 
Uh, it's a smaller version and that can make a big difference for a lot of students and it can also help so if maybe they get socially anxious they're not really used to working with a lot of people and it's overwhelming for them if you're playing a small-sided game it's going to be a lot less overwhelming for them lower your targets so if you've got basketball hoops um, that are at standard height you could use a hula hoop and just hang it on the wall or tape it up on the wall and have students make uh, shots at the hula hoops. Um, you could hang a hula hoop from your basketball hoop. Again, that would just make it a lower target so that way your students could be more successful. Um, and then make sure that you've got clear markers for the boundaries. So again, students with visual impairments, they maybe can't see the black line or blue line or whatever color line you have on the floor of the gym. But if you could put cones um, every couple feet so that they can see them or maybe poly spots something that's big and colorful I I guess poly spots would probably be better if they get close to the line um, Rather than cones so that they're not knocking over all the cones But just make sure that your your markers are clear for the boundaries and your students know where those boundary lines are So this is something that I used when I um, taught early childhood adapted physical education. Uh, in Minnesota, we call it DAPE, Developmental Adapted Physical Education. So I had a smart board in my gym. I was fortunate enough to have a smart board and I made um, this smart notebook software, or I used the smart notebook software to make presentations for my class. Every class period, I used the same um, program and then it was very similar to uh, my classes circle time so I had gone into their special ed classrooms and their general ed classrooms to see what their classroom teachers did and they all had this very similar kind of a presentation where it was a circle time and they all sat around the screen and they could see everything they participated they followed along with music um, and it was really successful. The students understood it. They knew the routine. And so I started implementing that in my uh, adapted PE classes. So every day I met my students at the gym door, welcomed them into my class, and they all had to go find a spot on the floor. I had carpet squares. And so they had to go find their carpet square. And then uh, we started out with a very basic warm up. So I was working with three to five year olds with varying disabilities. Um, I had some students who were nonverbal, non mobile, they were in wheelchairs, um, they weren't able to do anything independently, and so everything for them was hand over hand. But then at the same time, in some of the same classes, I had students who were running around the gym and just couldn't get their bodies to sit still long enough um, to pay attention. So I, I used the same warm up song every day for the entire school year because even by the end of the school year the students were not necessarily getting all of the parts right but they were still being successful because they were practicing it every day practicing their same routine and by the time that the end of the school year came they had improved so even if they could only get one of the four parts so i had clap swing your arms bend your knees and stomp your feet um, some students were able to clap and swing their arms but maybe couldn't bend their knees and stomp their feet so I had to make modifications for each of my students, um, and I had a couple education assistants with me in my classes. So a lot of it, like I said, was hand over hand, um, but they all knew that routine. So they come into the gym, they find their space, and we start with a warm up. And then next I had my I can statement, so I can follow directions and collect items. And then I had a game um, where they needed to collect ladybugs, so they were little velcro ladybugs all over the floor and that I'd spread out and I had three different colors red blue and green and then they all got a frog to wear on their hand and it was a fabric frog and they had to go around and pick up the ladybugs and I what I wanted them to focus on was using one hand to pick up the ladybug with their frog and then use the other hand to pull the ladybug off the frog and then drop it in the bucket um, so for all of my lessons, I created video models. So I used video modeling for every lesson so that the students could see what the expectation was for the game and the activity that we were doing that day. And um, a lot of times I was able to use my students in those videos. So they were very excited to see themselves in the videos. Um, after we did our skill work, then we went back to this, the carpet squares and I had a free play video so they got to go around the 
gym and play with different equipment. They could either choose to keep playing the activity for the day, or they could choose a bike, a ball, a scooter, or to play in some cubes that I had in my gym. So again, with this free play uh, screen, I had a video for that as well. So they would watch the video to see what their choices were. Then I would call on them individually. They would come up, touch the screen, and pick either the bike, the ball, the scooter, or the cubes, and then they would go back to the activity that they were doing, and they, or not back to the activity, they would go to the activity um, that they had chosen. So I would make sure to watch, and if I had a student that came up and touched ball, but then he ran over and he grabbed a scooter, I would redirect him to, nope, you chose a ball, so you get to play with a ball today. Um, and if they wanted to change activities, they would run up and touch the screen again. So a lot of it was very structured, um, and that really helped them to know the routine. And then also it correlated with what they were doing in their classroom setting. So they were able to um, use that same process in both my gym and their classroom to use the smart board and interact, um, and then the video modeling. So my the entire early childhood center that I worked at, we all used video models for our activities. So here is an example of what the video modeling is. So video modeling is a way to show your students a desired behavior, skill, or task that you want them to perform through a video that you created using a student to demonstrate that behavior, skill, or task. So basically you're going to make a video of a game or activity or um, a routine that you want your students to follow and you want to record your students doing this activity on a regular basis so maybe they're not doing it correctly but you're just going to record everything um, and put together a example of how it should look so when to use the video modeling uh, I would recommend using it if you're doing, like I said, routines, so classroom rules, maybe lining up, cleaning up equipment, uh, for functional skills, so things like washing their hands or getting water from a water fountain. Uh, skill demonstration, so throwing, kicking, catching, any skill that you want your students to be doing, um, you can create a video model for that. Game demonstration, so you could show them a brief example of how the game will be played or how the game works. Um, or if it's an activity, maybe you have them shooting baskets and you want to show them how to shoot a basket. So you could do that uh, through video modeling. You're going to find an area that your students are struggling with and then create a video for that area. So maybe it's a content area. Maybe they're just really struggling um, with soccer skills and they, they just don't quite get it. They keep picking up the ball and throwing it. Um, you can create a video model for that activity. So the steps to make a video model. You find the problem or the area that uh, your students are struggling with. You get all the equipment that you're going to need to make the video. Set up the equipment that you need and then plan how you want the video to be. So where are you going to stand? Um, are you going to use your iPad, your phone? Um, what device are you going to be using, and then what the activity or game is that you want demonstrated. Get some students that you want to use for your video. So maybe you do have some students who are really successful at um, hitting a ball off a tee, and you know that they know that skill, um, but maybe they don't do it perfectly every time, and that's okay. Just get a student that you want to use for your model uh, for your video, and even if they're unsuccessful, at least you can still incorporate them maybe into parts of the video that you're making. Explain what you want the students to demonstrate, and then film everything. So film all of the attempts that the students are making, so that way you can piece it together for the final product. And then you're going to edit the movie or the video using iMovie. To me, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, if you don't have iMovie, if you don't have an iPad or an iPhone or a Mac that you can use to create your video, you can always figure out another program to use. Um, there's a lot of free software programs that you can use and um, you can edit the video that way. But for me, iMovie was the easiest to use. Um, and I most of the time I just used it on my iPad so that I could just put the clips in, edit it, and then um, add sound to or the video or add music to the video. 
um, you want to show the video to your students before asking them to perform the task. So after you've made your video, then you're going to use that video to show your students the demonstration of what it is that you want them to do. So once you're finally in class and you're playing the game or doing the activity, then they will be able to um, see the video of what it is that you're asking them to do, and then they will have better success at performing the activity. So here, um, these clips for some reason play sideways, but um, here is some clips that I did of that ladybug activity that I was telling you about. So the students were playing around and they, they knew the task that they were supposed to be doing. They knew what steps they were supposed to do, but as you'll see, they weren't quite following all of those steps. Um, so I just filmed everything and then I was able to piece it all together to make a video model so that they could see what a successful uh, demonstration would look like. You can see the student here. She was able to pull the ladybug off the frog, but then she goes around and picks the frog or the ladybug up with her empty hand and not the frog. And then here's another video that I took that I was able to piece together to make the final video. So that student picked up his ladybug and then he got kind of distracted and didn't quite make it to the bucket with his bugs right away. So I was able to piece together all of those and make this. So it was a very short video, only nine seconds long, but I got that first student who was able to pick up the frog or pick up the ladybug with the frog. And then the second student was able to take the ladybug off the frog and drop it in the bucket. Um, so then anytime I did this activity after this demonstration, this video model that I made, I used this video to show them this is the activity that I want to do. Um, and my students would get so excited to see themselves in the videos. Um, so that was always a lot of fun too. Um, and then I have just a few other examples of the video models. So some of the classroom teachers used it for lining up, um, for their morning meeting and just different activities going outside. And, um, like I said, at the early childhood center, we used it for everything. So you can make your own video and then you can always contact me if you have questions. After I returned to Robbinsdale Area Schools, uh, I worked at our transition center and I taught a habits of wellness fitness class. So this is what I used with those students. Um, we would go to the YMCA every day and my students were able to just use all of the facilities there. Um, they could swim, they could use the machines, they could go into the gym. Um, and they had some equipment there, just mostly just basketballs. But I wanted my students, because they were uh, 18 to 21 years old, I wanted them to be able to do independent skills. So things that they would be able to do when they were then on their own uh, as an adult. Some of my students had said, you know, oh, I had weightlifting in high school or I've lifted weights before by myself. But I wanted to make sure that they had a good foundation um, to know what to do, why they should be doing it, and then how it can benefit them. So I spent the first week in the classroom with my students and just went over these different pieces. So we went through our introductions. I asked them what their previous experiences were with fitness and exercise, if they had a membership at the Y, had they been in adapted PE, um, did they play sports, did they play for Special Olympics, anything like that. So that helped me to kind of get an idea of what their background was and what it was that they were comfortable doing. I then had some conversations with them uh, and just tried to talk to them and ask them again more of uh, getting background information for what they knew so that I knew how to teach them better. So I would ask, you know, do you think you should work out every day? And 
what kinds of things should you be working out if you are going to work out every day? Should you do the same muscle groups every day? Um, what happens to your body when you exercise? And then after I had asked that, they had all kind of given me different examples. And then I said, okay, we're going to stand up. And then I had them run in place. And um, well, first I had them check their heart rate. And then I had them run in place and then check their heart rate again. And so it kind of could show them, you know, once, once you do get active and once you are moving around a lot, your heart rate increases. And that's one of the benefits that you have from working out. Um, I also talked about what happens to your muscles when you exercise and then um, some pieces that I wanted them to work on once we got started and once we started going to the Y. What are reps versus sets? So a lot of times you hear that um, academic language in the gym or in the weight room. Um, and so it's, you know, what are reps? What are sets? And why is that important to know? And then I wanted to know what their personal goals were. So if they had any personal goals, like um, they maybe wanted to get into shape or they wanted to lose weight or they wanted big arm muscles. Um, they had all sorts of different things that they wanted to work on personally. So that way I could then know what things I wanted to work with them on at the Y when we did go to the gym and I could see, you know, hey, you've been doing a lot of great arm um, exercises and you're doing awesome. Have you noticed anything? Are you getting closer to reaching your goal? And then I could always tie that back to them, um, to their goal. So what exercises will you work on with those goals? So I had them look up different exercises for their goals. So maybe they wanted to build up abs and um, they wanted to get stronger calf muscles. So I had them look up different activities and exercises and we talked about the different muscle groups and what exercises worked on each of those different muscle groups. Um, lastly, we talked about what they could do in their community or at home to work on those goals. So after they graduated, what could they do to keep um, attaining that goal or achieving that goal? And what could they do to then set new goals and work on those goals? Um, so the next steps, you talk again about the different muscle groups, how you can group them together to build a workout. Um, then I assigned my students to each muscle group. So I had two students working on the legs, two students working on chest, two on the back, um, and they just worked on the different muscle groups and found what exercises they could do. And then they shared out as a group for the whole class to hear um, what exercises they could work on for those different muscle groups. And then I gave them a calendar with the days that they will be going to the gym and I had them fill out their own rotation. So um, this would be, again, skills that they would need to have that they could do on their own once they were, um, after they had graduated and they were on their own uh, as an adult, what they could be working on. So they would need to be able to have a calendar and figure out what the rotation would be for themselves. So I had them, I grouped together the muscle groups for them so that they would know you know, why does it make sense if you're going to work out your chest? Why should you also work out your upper back that same day? And um, why should you work out your shoulders and arms, legs? And then I had a choice day for them so they could choose what to do every Friday. And then uh, they rotated. They would write down um, their calendar. Each day we had class. I had marked off the days that we wouldn't have class. Um, and they were able to fill in the rotations with Again, some help from myself and then some of my educational assistants that were in the class. Um, and it varied based on each of my students. Some of my students were higher functioning. They maybe had jobs. They, you know, were only here to kind of finish up a few credits that they were missing or maybe still work on a few skills that they needed, um, a lot of employment skills. But then I also had students who weren't as high functioning and maybe they would not be quite as independent on their own after they graduated, but they all still were able to get an idea of what they could be doing as adults uh, when they were done at school. And then I created a fitness tracker for them. I made it very basic um, and I'll show you that next. And then I taught them how to fill out that fitness tracker. I also went to the Y and I took pictures of all of the different equipment, um, mostly just the like the weights and the different grips, the different bikes, the different um, pieces or machines that they would be using. And I made um, 
picture slideshow to help get them familiarized with it and to know like okay if I move the pin down to 20 but there's a little notch at the top that's all the way over on the five it's not just 20 pounds that I'm lifting I'm lifting 25 pounds um, and some of the machines at the Y that we went to were different so they weren't all exactly the same and so I thought it was really helpful for my students and they told me as well that it was really beneficial for them to see the different ways that they could do the do the weights and calculate you know um, how much weight they were lifting so it also was helping with their math skills um, and going to the Y was also really great for them because we were able to socialize so every morning we went at the same time and there was always the same group of people there working out um, that were they were super friendly really nice um, and you know they recognized us if one of my students wasn't there they would ask oh where's so and so you know I, I saw he was here yesterday I hope he's doing okay and um, it was really awesome to build that sense of community um, for my students as well so this is an example of the fitness tracker I had created for them so I just wanted them to put the date what exercise they were doing and I made sure to point out that if they were using machines they could read Know, bicep curl tricep extension on the machine and where they could find that information so they would just be able to copy it and write it in the box um, how much weight they were using so look at again the picture or the the different <laughs> weights um, where they put the pin and then if the top bar had any additional weight to it um, and then I had them again using that academic language of reps and sets how many reps did they do and how many sets did they do and then I had this extra piece muscle groups for some of my students they were able to tell me you know, what muscle group they were working when they were doing those different um, tricep extensions and bicep curls they could say I was working on my arms um, or if I was doing curl ups I was working on my abs whatever muscle group that they were working on that day they could fill in there so this I, is a routine that I created for one of my students, Sam, who is in a wheelchair, um, and he had a one-to-one -one adult with him at all times, so either myself or my educational assistant would be there and help him do the exercises. Uh, this routine, Sam was actually really awesome, and he knew exactly what his routine was, what exercises he wanted to do. Um, he was always wanting to impress the ladies he said so this uh, packet that I made was actually more for his education assistant that worked with him most of the time because he struggled to remember what the <laughs> exercises were that Sam was working on so um, <clears throat> I had just made this and then it was also nice so if I did have a sub educational assistant they could I could just hand them this packet and say here's what Sam's working on today he can let you know um, what exercises he's doing or what he wants to do and then they could just follow along so I made sure to put the weight that Sam started at he always started at two and a half pounds and then if he wanted to he could move up to seven and a half but he would let myself or the other adult know um, what weight to do and then with Sam also so he wasn't able to do like bicep curls with both arms at the same time because he was very spastic in his uh, muscle movements so he could only do one arm at a time or one leg at a time um, and then I made uh, again like how to adjust the machine so some things that you would think are really basic maybe some of the education assistants or the paras people that you're working with may not know what how to adjust the equipment or how to move different um, pieces in the gym if they're not as comfortable so that was really helpful and then um, there was various handles that Sam could use so I did whatever handle Sam preferred um, he really liked to use that one because it was easier for him to grip and so I had him um, pose for all of these pictures for me and I took pictures uh, and he was very excited to be the model for his workout routine um, I had Sam working on tricep extensions um, if the railing on the the piece of equipment was at the top he could do his tricep extensions uh, if you moved it to the bottom then he could do his bicep curls he was also able to do chest press and seated row uh, so you can see he's in a wheelchair and he was able to drive himself everywhere and kind of back himself into the space um, so here there was like uh, 
big space that he could back his chair into to be able to do the chest press. And then if he turned it around and he was facing the machine, he could do the seated row. Um, we also gave him some two pound free weights, which he could use, um, with his hands independently for the most part. Um, his left hand, he was a little bit stronger with his, uh, left hand preferred. So he was able to do shoulder press with his left hand. Um, and I just made sure to hold my hand under his elbow so that he knew, you know, where to stop when bringing it down. And then he would just push it back up. Um, when I would do it with his right hand, I would just make sure to hold on. So it was hand over hand, but just to make sure that the weight wouldn't drop. He was lifting all the weight himself. Um, it was just more of a safety. Uh, this machine here, so it was the arm crank machine. Sam was able to use this. So typically the person would sit on this seat here and then they would uh, use a crank similar to how uh, you pedal a bike, but it would be with your arms. And I was able to turn it. There's this piece here, so lock and rotate, and you could turn it so that way the handles were outward. So if someone wanted to stand here and use it, they could. Or Sam, he was able to use his wheelchair and then get right up against the machine, and he was able to grip onto the um, bar, actually, not the handle itself, not the piece that's uh, vertical, but the horizontal bar, he was able to grip onto that. And then most of the time he had to use just one arm at a time. Um, but he was able to sometimes try it with two arms. And then I just had to hold onto his hand to make sure it didn't slip off of the machine. Um, he could also do rear deltoid fly. So they had some of these, uh, resistance bands here that were smaller and then we would just put them around his arms and he could uh, pull his arms apart. And if he wanted to do more weight, we could always add a second band and he was able to do that independently as well. Uh, so a lot of the equipment for Sam, he was able to do all these exercises. He just couldn't access the equipment necessarily himself. And a lot of it, I made sure to guide his muscle um, or his arm movements, his leg movements and make sure that he wasn't um, going out of rotation or doing any extra movements that were unnecessary. So um, for Sam, a lot of it, again, was just being able to get the equipment. So in everyday life, he has a PCA with him. So if he were to go to the Y with the PCA, the PCA doesn't necessarily need to know how to do any of these things because Sam would be able to tell his PCA you know, hey, I want to do some rear deltoid flies. I want to do some bicep curls. Here's how you need to adjust the machine. Um, and he can walk that person through it. He's just not physically able to do it on his own. Uh, so a lot of my students, what I did with them was I would just go through and, you know, I had students, like I said, that would say, oh, I had weight training class in high school. I already know what I'm doing. I don't need your help. But they didn't have nearly as much equipment at high school as they did at the Y. So I would go through and I would show them new machines and new equipment that they could use. Um, a lot of my students really enjoyed getting to try some of the, do the different machines, the new things that they hadn't been able to use in high school. And they actually preferred some of those things. Um, most of my students I found stuck to machines. So they weren't really... Uh, as comfortable using free weights or uh, dumbbells. And so I had to teach them how to do those pieces. But again, once they kind of get that foundational piece of finding out what to do, they can do it independently. Um, and a lot of them, <laughs> I made sure to give bring a pencil every day for them, uh, bring their paper for them, and bring their calendar for them. So their fitness tracker and then their calendar of what the rotation was. So I just would give it out. Um, they all started, we would stretch together as a class. We'd find an open space um, and do some stretches. And then we would do a cardio workout or cardio warm up. So they could choose either a treadmill, an elliptical, or a bike. And Sam, most of the time, would choose the arm crank or um, because he, he struggled to move his muscles. Um, as quickly, he would often just get going and start working on his exercises um, because he wouldn't be able to get in as many reps and sets as his peers in the class would. So they would do the workout routines. Um, and as, as they were doing the cardio, 
um, I went around and I handed out their their calendar and their fitness tracker was stapled to their calendar and then they uh, were given a pencil and every time I would ask them what is your routine today because I also found that a lot of days they didn't know what the date was or what day of the week it was and so um, again it was just verifying like I know you know how to read a calendar I know you know how to tell what exercises you should be doing but do you even know what day it is today um, and even as adults especially now during all this distance learning I don't know what day it is most days so it's good to have that check and balance piece um, when you're working with your students so they all got their uh, fitness tracker their calendars a pencil and then they had to be on the uh, cardio machine for at least I'd say like five to ten minutes most days and they would watch the clock they knew when they needed to get to work um, and then I just kind of let them have free reign once they figured out what it was that the routine was that they wanted to be doing um, they were able to independently work out and I mostly would just walk around and tell them like hey that's not really safe how you're trying to do the bench press but here let me show you what the proper way to do that is or hey make sure you find a partner um, and your partner is spotting you for that activity so I had a small class um, we only had eight students in the class and I had all of them partner up so that two people would be doing arms the same day two people would be doing legs the same day um, two people you know chest and back and so they each were working on different areas so that not everyone had leg day the same day so I tried to make sure to stagger their routines and um, that really helped and it also helped them to know like hey my partner wants to do this partner workout um, ab workout with medicine balls and let's you know that's a great idea let's go do that as a group and so they didn't um, have to worry too much about like standing out or doing something on their own and being self-conscious they kind of had that confidence because they were able to work with a partner and see their peers being successful as well um, and every once in a while I would try again to throw in new activities or exercises and say like hey have you guys tried these resist resistance bands before or have you tried using a BOSU ball or hey let's go over and use this machine and they would just get so energized by seeing new activities and um, getting more ideas because doing the same exact machines every day is going to be repetitive and boring for them but if they could get in those new exciting activities um, that really helped them thrive and so those are just some things that I found that have helped with my students um, if you have any questions at all feel free you can send me an email um, you can follow me on Twitter send me a message and I would be more than happy to answer any questions for you like I said so I've um, I taught adapted physical education at the early childhood center and elementary schools for four years and then the last two years I have been at uh, middle schools high schools and then the transition center so I've worked with ages 3 to 21 um, and a lot of different disabilities um, I teach in a low-income title one school district and so I've got a lot of experience with buying my own equipment or making my own equipment um, and I'm more than willing to share ideas and feel free to take anything that I have and use it for yourself